Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have an absolutely killer talk with the Orlando Magic's Dave Tenney. You know, after a real quick intro, guys, Dave dives right into it, talking about the new position he has. Well, it's year two, but it's a newer position down in Orlando, you know, and the things that he has learned after that first year and how some things from Seattle have really done well coming with him and, and how he's, he's kind of looked back and had to re-evolve his thinking a bit. That, uh, then we get into, you know, the increased number of games and, and the great amount of travel, how that impacts what they're looking at and, and drives discussions and decisions. You know, and then we get into discussing you know, the culture of the sport, the different types of athletes, and then the similarities across the board when you're talking about soccer players and basketball players and how this has really helped mold how they handle their guys on a daily basis. We finish off talking about you know, building resilience in the athletes and how you know, these newer expansions with the G League and how the entire organizational uh, culture has really impacted how they're handling these younger athletes and how they're looking to build them moving forward. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. David Tenney, this one's been uh, on the queue for a long time. I'm really glad we're able to get this down. I appreciate you uh, having me on. It's my first time on, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm really excited about this because uh, – as a guy who grew up playing soccer and a guy who now has the luxury of, of working in, in basketball, you're, you're kind of a guy that, that I love to hear talk about things and read things about what you're doing. So for the three quarters of a human being listen to this that don't know who you are, let's give them the SparkNotes version of uh, where you're at, what you're doing, and how you got there. Okay. Um, I am currently the High Performance Director for the Orlando Magic in the NBA. Um, Second year starting, just starting the second year there. Um, Came there from nine years with the Seattle Sounders, where I kind of started as a fitness coach, strength conditioning coach, and then um, evolved into performance director over that nine-year period as our 
staff kind of grew and as the club continued to develop and evolve what we were doing. Um, prior to that was two years with uh, Kansas City and MLS. And then um, you know, about four or five years between George Mason University and the Washington Freedom Women's um, Pro Team um, prior to that. Um, and then, you know, kind of a, a, a non-spectacular uh, six or seven year pro career in soccer um, that, well, just a last trick, so I'll just say that. So. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So there was a lot of things that you guys built and a lot of um, kind of tributaries that went throughout the world of high performance from the work that you did in Seattle when moving, how much of that came with you and how much of that, like looking back now, you know, your work in Seattle has, has pushed things forward in the NBA with you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think, I think you, I think what I learned is you, know, you, you take on a new position, you take on a new job and you think you can take a lot of the same tools with you and you can apply them and whether that be, you know, the different technologies you're using, um, and I think it's funny because now that we have a, you know, a new staff, a new group of, of uh, people in our department kind of up and running, you know, one of the, the talks that we've had fairly consistently is that I've shown them a lot of kind of what we've done, what we did in Seattle. And, but I've been very clear that what it will look like in Orlando will have not a ton of similarity with what we're going to what we did in, in Seattle. Um, but the the principles, the approach should be the same. Um, so picking technology that you know affects decision making on a daily basis, um, making sure that you create good process. Um, you know, and I think sometimes people that are in one place for a long time, you you sometimes forget that you probably organically grew your system within that environment over a lot of years, and. Uh, and and you really used it to make a lot of your decisions and determine how you did things, and it's un you know it's it's unrealistic and unfair to think you can just take that and apply it to a new environment if you go there. So I think your you know, my first my first thought when I went is like oh, I'm going to take all the same tools with me, um, and then you realize okay the the sport's different and the demands placed on the athletes are subtly different, um, you know, and and how you communicate things to. Um, coaching or management there is subtly different. Um, and, and so then you just have to kind of drop a lot of things and, and again, the principles stay the same, but, but slowly grow something. And I think, you know, we were in Seattle for nine years and we built up a, you know, a, what I considered a really, really comprehensive, good system. Um, and, and I think we're you know, now starting year two in Orlando and it's going and it's going to be the same process. But um, it's about starting out really basic and then kind of every year adding one more layer of complexity to what you do um, to help build that, that system. I love that. And I love the fact that all of this is principle-based. Can we maybe run down that rabbit hole? What are the principles that Dave Tenney has when it comes to what he's looking at and looking for and questions he's trying to answer you know, with the athletes he gets to work with? Um, but I think the starting point is what are the athletes actually doing in a game? You know, and so in Seattle, we had, we had, you know, optical tracking systems. Um, and, and in the NBA now we've got similar optical tracking systems with second spectrum. And so you can start kind of seeing, um, where the different demands placed on the athletes in the game. Um, and, and then, and then I think it's important. The next step is, okay, what guys are doing, um, in practice, um, how reflective are those exercises, what they're doing in practice, um, contributing to, you know, kind of their, their preparation for games. Um, and then I think then th third, then you look at what they're doing in the weight room and how do you supplement what they're doing in the weight room with what they're maybe not getting during a court or field practice session. Um, and then overarching, you're seeing, okay, how are they actually responding to the different training stimuli, whether it's on the court or whether it's in the weight room, long term. And then I think you have within the course of these you know, professional seasons, um, 
with the you know the the travel and the and the number of games and you know and uh, the different demands there. How are they coping with just the entire system of overall load and fatigue? Um, so I think if you get all those together, that should be the basis of your system, and then you just have to kind of pick. All of your decisions come from being able to quantify all of those things as best you can, and sometimes sometimes it can be very subjective. Um, you, you hope not to, but there are times it can be sub subjective. And then from all all of those different areas, then that's where your whole kind of decision making process should should start up. Now you touched upon fatigue mo uh, monitoring and management, and you're now in a situation where you went from a a league where like a, a busy week for you guys was two games. Yep. And now a busy week for you guys could be four. Yep. And two of those could be in on the left coast. So how have you kind of run back and, and looked at this differently in order to to account for such such like intense loads of, of a different kind of magnitude when it comes to this extended travel and things of that nature? Um, I think, yeah, I, I think sleep, sleep is, is the first one you kind of look at. And I think that sleep is the first one that, um, is kind of a shock to, to new athletes or staff people's systems. Um, the consistently getting back at two or three in the morning. Um, and, and we always adjust practice time if we get back late. Um, you know, for instance, I mean, last night we got back at two in the morning and we don't meet today till 4 p.m. So um, I think prioritizing sleep is important, but then, you know, you we have to make sure that the athletes are sleeping. Um, and... And if they are not able to sleep, and, and, and for the most part, I think most of the guys give us you know, really good feedback um, from a wellness standpoint of how well they're sleeping. Um, you know, we have to look into who has issues and you know, do certain athletes need melatonin supplementation, for example. Um, so, uh, it, yeah, I, what I find is probably the demands of each game are less. I mean, let's be honest, if uh, you're playing... Two games in seven days is a really heavy demand in soccer, whereas you know two to two games in seven days in an NBA schedule, from just purely from a on-court physical load, is not not the same level. Um, they're not kind of full-out max efforts um, within a 48-minute basketball game as they are within a 90-minute soccer game. So it's really kind of this. I, I think your viewpoint changes. It's kind of this slow drip of kind of looking at who's not coping with a you know, a four day, a seven day, an eight day, a 21 day period so well. And you, have, you kind of have to f figure out how you're going to break up the kind of periods of time and determine who's not coping with those certain periods of time. And then how then with that discussion has that changed? Because you're now looking at a different athlete, like completely when it comes to demographics and I mean, there's a bunch of guys out in Seattle who English wasn't even their first language. Yeah. So yeah. how does like the culture of the two sports now play into that and impact this entire driving force that you guys are trying to build? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if it's the culture of the athlete that should dictate everything or if it's more um, the nature of the, the sport and the schedule. Um, I'm just trying to think through them. I and mean, I think that's just the, the travel component is so critical in a lot of ways um, within basketball. I mean, I think that's even overriding more than just the, the, the background of the athletes that you're, that you're dealing with. Um, in both cases, I think there's always, you know, I, I think that, it's funny after a year of, of uh, you know, being in the NBA and comparing them to the average soccer player. I mean, there's there's a ton of similarities as well. And I think sometimes people don't give um, enough credence to the similarities of a soccer player versus a basketball player. And um, it's kind of funny because I've, you know, I've run into a couple of strength coaches on the circuit that have come from uh, NFL teams previously. And, 
you know, the, the NFL strength coach who's worked with NBA guys will kind of talk to me and like, just be so frustrated with the, the NBA athletes kind of difference in approach to strength training than an NFL guy. And I'm kind of thinking, well, it's just the same approach as a soccer player, like so- soccer players at the end of the day, like they just want to play the sport in the field or the court. Right. And so they just want to play. And so then it's about kind of figuring out how you're going to give these guys little 15, 20 minute periods, just get, having them have enough buy-in that they're going to give you 20 minutes daily or four times a week to make the changes you need to make in the weight room. And they'll do that. Um, but they're, they're kind of wired instinctually to be guys that they just want to play their sport. Um, and so I think from that standpoint, it's not, it was not as different. I think sometimes as, as people might make it out. No. And that's a, that's, that's exactly where I was hoping you were going to go with this. So let's keep running down that. When you guys are sitting down, you and your staff, and you're talking about these 20 minute periods, how are you establishing where those need to go? Because in that short amount of time, that's got to be like pinpoint accurate for each one of those guys. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, and that's and that's where it then comes to really being able to have a good picture of what is happening on the court, right? Because again, you know, um, the different the, the the one major difference between basketball and and soccer is that you know the basketball sessions can get they can get fairly long. Um, you know, it's it's not uncommon to have kind of two hour basketball sessions where in soccer, you go to you know, two hour period. Like that's, that's pretty rare. Um, so you have to look at, you know, be, be able to have a good sense and a good system that's picking up what, what is that load that's going on on the court, how much neuromuscular fatigue might be there. And that then may affect, you know, the lower body work that, um, you may be able to do, you know, the number of times a week you may actually be able to do lower body work is really dictated by how much you're practicing on the court. Um, and so I think, you know, getting those time periods is really important, you know, within the NBA also, I think the interesting thing with the NBA is it's, it's such a young league now where I think we may have half of our team now, you know, Orlando in particular is a super, super young league, but or sorry, super young team, but we may have half of our guys in our team under the age of 23. Um, so then that even changes radically your approach to the weight room as well is because these are still really young athletes that can and should be making some big gains in kind of physical development um, versus, you know, kind of our, our MLS model in Seattle where we had half our team was over 30. Um, so I think dictating what guys need is not just based on now what, what guys done recently um, on the court, but now the next level is where are they developmentally? And the NBA being such a young league as we have a responsibility to use those 20 minutes, 20 minute blocks as much as we can to get guys. So by the time they're 23, that they are a a developed, resilient athlete that can tolerate heavy loads. Love it. So now when we look at something that a lot of coaches talk about when we're looking at this whole idea of minimal effective dose, when you're looking at these younger athletes, we know that they don't require as much of a stimulus to elicit the adaptation you're trying to, to have yeah. upon them. So how does that evolve then for you? And how much does that help you being that they're such a young team and you have these small windows? Um, oh, I, I think part of that goes then also into the playing time, right? Cause I think then the tricky part in all this is, yeah, we have a young team and we want them to be developmentally you know, strong by the age of 23, but we might also have a team where your young guys have to play a lot of minutes. And if they don't have that robustness or resiliency yet, then you do kind of have to be careful. Um, so I guess, you know, that, that's another layer that just, you know, kind of goes over top of all that. Um, No. I mean, where, where else do you want me to, uh, to go with that? And... No, I think that that's exactly it, is, is that, you know, that you're in a tough spot because you're drafting kids that are 19 to 20 more often than not. 
and then they're playing a bulk of the minutes. So then now you're a bit hamstrung with what you're trying to do training wise because you need these individuals to develop, but yeah. the time needs to be spent somewhere else. Yeah. 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 And I think that's where, I guess, you know, the, the, the next, the next piece of that is that's where I think that, um, your relationship with the coaching staff becomes critical. Um, and that as a, you know, physical deport, uh, performance department, we have to know that these guys have to be really good basketball players. Um, and we have to respect that these guys, if they're 19 or 20, they're not finished basketball players in the, you know, smallest sense at all. They've got a ton of work they still need to do. But then on the flip side, then the basketball coaches also have to have an understanding that for these guys that have the careers they want, that they have to allow us the ability to you know, kind of build in that resiliency and uh, um, robustness in the weight room. And, and then ultimately, I think that comes from the philosophy brought down by you know, the president and GM, um, which you know, we're lucky in, in Orlando to have that kind of full across the board buy-in, which is, I think it's, it's rare and it's really unique and special. But um, you know, within the NBA, it's the, the presidents and the GMs that are such critical people in terms of setting your philosophy for all of this across the board. Um, and hiring a performance staff that kind of sees the big picture and how you develop 19 and 20 year old NBA kids, but then also, uh, has the awareness to create a, or to create a, a coaching staff that is aware about all this. Um, and I think that's, that's rare, but that's, that should be the model of how it should be. So then how does that model then carry into all aspects then of the organization because you have a now with the G League starting to yep. gain some legs. Like how does that now carry through all the way down to them? And yep. how does that impact you from a management standpoint? Because you now have, I mean, you literally have to be two places at once at, at times. Yeah. I mean, and that's where I think the, the, uh, the dynamic of, of my position has changed so much, you know, that this you know, high performance director position or whatever label you want to put on it um, is really managerial at so many levels because yeah, we, we're lucky that, that our G league team is in Lakeland, which is about an hour South of, uh, of Orlando. And that what that means is we can actually have NBA roster guys go down there and play and come back. Um, which is which is nice, and that's a you know that, that's a good bonus. But then we also have to make sure that what they're doing is you know that we're tracking what they're doing, um, and that you know their staff members that are also part of my staff. So we have a you know a head a, head athletic trainer, head strength coach, and then a, a performance um, intern that are also part of our staff here um, that spend a lot of time with us. Um, through the entire off season so that we're, again, we're all philosoph you know, philosophically aligned, but then we have a system that's up there. We're actually like kind of tracking subjective notes and, you know, programs completed and, you know, and, and those types of things on a, on a software platform that we know exactly what everyone is doing across the board. I love it. Now, when they're doing that though, again, it's, it's back to them pounding more on the court and yep. more time playing, which of course obviously is important. Uh, but when you're talking about building this resilience and you're talking about building, you know, these other physical qualities, are there, are there times where, where you're looking at this and saying, I get what you're saying. What are your thoughts on maybe not this week for player X as opposed to player Y? Um, yeah. I mean, I think those are all, those are all conversations we, we can have, um, I found that that's not that hasn't been the case that often where we would hold a guy. Typically, typically what happens is that your you know your athletes kind of in the bottom of the of the roster of the NBA are probably not getting enough minutes. So there's not that many times where we feel like there'd kind of be some some fatigue element where we would not want to send a guy down to the G League to get minutes. Um, you know he may be the 12th, 13th guy in the roster for 
three, four days in a row, maybe he's traveling with us. And then, you know, a, a guy comes back from injury, which might push a guy off our active roster. And we want him to go down and get minutes because, uh, you know, the, the challenge, you know, your big, your biggest challenge across the board is um, these guys that are, you know, number 12 and number 13 on your roster. They're traveling everywhere and not playing minutes. And you might be in a hotel gym somewhere trying to get the adequate, you know, loading. Um, and, you know, and, and then actually be able to give those guys minutes in the G league, I think is a, is a, you know, a huge advantage. Well, that and having an actual facility on site where there you can perform the training you actually would want them to do. Yeah. And and I think what's going to happen down the road is that uh, again, how teams are using the G league is, is really one of the fastest evolving areas in the NBA. Um, I think you're, you're seeing staffs in the, in the G league that are getting bigger. I think, I think what's happening, especially with so many, you know, kind of young players in the NBA, um, cause you'll have, you know, lottery picks that might be 19 or 20 and they might need two, three, four years. And they might, you know, there, there's plenty of, uh, of examples of, of lottery pick players playing some games in, in the G league at times, um, cause they need them. Um, but what that means is then you have to be able to provide an environment for that lottery pick to go down in the G league. And, and from a, a, physical prep standpoint from a nutrition standpoint from a medical um, treatment standpoint it, it's got to be a very very good level um, if you're going to send that guy down there as well so within the N- nba i think that's 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 probably what you're going to see over the next four to five years is that teams are going to invest more in their in their g league structure do you think a lot of that's going to have to deal with the fact that this one and done rule may be pulled it could be, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how that will affect you know, if if the NBA will take more risks on you know, high school kids, um, probably, um, which will mean that you know those guys may need to play minutes in the G League for them to to develop if they're not going off and spending that year or two in college, which then means that we must be able to provide a really good environment for them when they are when they are in the uh, uh, in, in the G League team. Yeah, and I think that, too, the, the the ability for them to kind of have that transition point, too. Because yep. if you're going from college and it's like 32 to 40 games tops, and now all of a sudden you're going to 80-plus, yep. that's with camp and all that stuff. I mean, now with college, the, the year has obviously been different, and it's been changed, and this and that, but um, that's a big jump. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the number of games, but then it's also the amount of travel, and it's just that the the months out on the road. Um, yeah, it's it's you know because I, I think that there's there's a physical toll, but I think also think there's a huge mental toll on how long the season is and how I just you got to show up to work every day for you know those seven months. Um, without, you know, without kind of the ups and downs and you got to be as consistent as possible and bring your effort every day. And, and yes, there's physical fatigue that goes along with that, but, but I also find it's, there's a, there's a whole mental piece, um, to kind of bring that energy and motivation daily. And I think that's, that would probably be one of the really special things that, you know, the, the guys that end up making it like that, you can tell at that age, you know, they're 19, 20, 21, like they, they want to, they, they're driven. And the ones that are driven and they're out there working and they can keep that mental effort every day, like those tend to be the guys that, that end up pushing through. Yeah, I love it. And I think that you see that even at our level too, that it's just that, you know, that grind never stops kind of yeah. as stupid as that line is. It really is kind of the truth. Yeah, I mean, I find that, you know, the biggest, if you just look at the structure of an NBA uh, schedule, and I think it's it's a it is a culture shock that everyone that comes from outside the NBA, um, you know, it's a culture shock for them. And that if we have a 1030 practice, a lot of times a young player is working with a shooting coach or, you know, an, an assistant coach um, at 830 or nine o'clock for a 1030 practice. And they get 20 minutes with their assistant coach and then they might come in the gym and they might do a 20 minute lift and then maybe they'll get breakfast at you know, little breakfast at 9.30 and then practice starts at 10.30. Um, so there's times where we will have, um, and every that's not just young players, that's across the board. It's this kind of uh, um, 
system where, which I love the individualization of each guy goes out and gets kind of 15 to 20 minutes with his, his uh, positional coach out in the court before, and then you know, maybe gets 15 to 20 minutes with one of our strength staff before or, or, or after that 20 minute block. Um, and essentially they've done 40 minutes of work before the practice even starts. Um, which means we have to be kind of very careful on how we plan, um, what guys are actually doing, but that, that, you know, like, again, the, the, the mental side of like being mentally sharp to focus with your position coach at eight 30 before a 10 30 practice. Um, and then to have the energy to come in the weight room to want to get better. And then, and then to go then 10 30 to 12 or 12 30 to bring that sustained effort on the court again. Like that's, that is a, that is a huge physical and cognitive kind of load on a daily basis. And maybe it's more cognitive, like maybe it's more of a cognitive load on a daily basis that guys kind of have to maintain over the course of those six, seven months. Yeah, especially when you're now looking at, again, throwing in flights all over the country and, yeah. and things of that nature. Yeah, which is kind of why, you know, we, we have the discussion with our staff is that, um, these guys come in and they're going to be on the court 20 minutes before practice. They're going to have practice. And as a, as a strength coach or, or as a therapist, you might have 15 or minutes with this guy. And it's, can you figure out what they need? Can you give them what they need in those 15 to 20 minutes that, that is, that is truly what they need, whether that be recovery, whether that be some sort of uh, um, corrective, whether that be a little you know stimulus in the weight room. Like we really have to be, you know, through our department, really clear for that, little 15, 20 minute block, we have them that what's that, that is that stimulus or, or work that they need on that particular day. Yeah, I love it. And it, you know, being so laser focused has got to be a fun, interesting challenge, uh, especially when you're bringing in, you know, more than half a dozen people to, to have yeah. all those eyes on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and yeah, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a communication piece. Um, it's, there's a huge communication element in you want your training room and you want your weight room to be as connected as possible. And as guys come in that they're able to be looked at by, you know, a therapist really quickly. Um, but ultimately when, when, when you have your choice and you'd like those 15 minutes before a guy goes on to be, you know, to, to be spent in the weight room if possible. Um, it's not always possible. I mean, sometimes guys go through the season and, you know, they might have some low back tightness. They might have some sort of, you know, restriction. Um, and they got to spend time with a therapist. And then, you know, the communication has to start quickly is who's going to, who's going to go where on a daily basis. And that, that comes over time and that comes with, um, you know, communication, understanding, trust. Um, you know, and, the, and I think those are all the things that we work on with our department. Um, but it's also, I mean, that's why we've we've recruited this department we have is that um, they're all people that were, you know, want to come in, want to be part of a team and operate together. And it's been, a, you know, this I couldn't be happier with where our staff is right now. Well, that's awesome, Dave. And that, I think that's really a killer spot to leave it at, man. I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today. This is uh, this is really an, an awesome look behind what you guys are doing down there. And I, I, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today. Well, thank you. I appreciate appreciate having me on, Jay. Um, happy to finally make it on after uh, listening for so many years. Well, I appreciate that, buddy. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. All the best this season, too, man. The, I hope you guys, uh, you know, hope the kids stay safe and stay healthy. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's good. It's fun. I mean, I think that you know, the, it, it's it's a long term, it's a long term project. So no, no doubt, um, it's a, it's an exciting time with the with all the young guys that are coming in the league. So. But listen, man, I got to get you out here on this, and, uh, and then I'll let you go. Shout out Big Willie Styles. Um, got to make sure that we get our man in here real quick because uh, I know that as soon as I tell him we spoke, he's going to be downloading all the episodes oh, to find yeah. this. Oh, yeah. All right. How's he doing with his uh, kettlebell swings? Dude, he's, he's loving life. He's, he's, yeah, he's the best. What else could you say other than the kid's the best? I love him. I love him. He's, he has an energy enthusiasm that uh, is extremely rare. So. Oh, 100%. Well, Dave, thank you so much, my friend. We'll be in touch real soon. Okay, thanks. Talk later, Jack. Yes, sir. Okay, bye. And a huge thanks to Orlando's Dave Tenney for spending the time with us today. Guys, there's not much more you can ask for, from Dave when it comes to open, honest, candid sharing. 
discussing with us what they're trying to build, how they're trying to move through this, how they're growing, what they're looking at on a daily basis, and really what their goals are with the athletes they're working with. I can't thank Dave enough for spending the time with us and being so open, honest, and candid with his sharing. This was absolutely sensational stuff. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. Again, we are just trying to get the best information out there possible to all the great coaches out there. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.